Larger and larger ships, more and more ships. Since 1960, that has been the pattern for the men of the Imauden Pilotage Service, whose task it is to conduct vessels bound for keys and jetties in the North Sea Canal area. Ships bound for Amsterdam, for centuries a centre of trade and maritime activity, and today Holland's principal industrial city. General cargo, ore, coal, timber, oil, cereals, the stream pours in. But the charm of Amsterdam's canals and gables is as great as ever. Harlem, centre of culture and of the graphic arts. Harlem, situated on the River Spahn, an artery carrying the lifeblood of industry. The Zahn area, Holland's larder, where in the 17th century the windmill heralded the era of industrial mechanization. <laughs> Felsenheim Oden, with its modern town hall. Felsen also boasts a ruined castle and broad, inviting sand. Imauden is Holland's largest deep-sea fishing port. Since the North Sea Canal came into being, many industries have settled in Imauden. For example, the Royal Netherlands blast furnaces and steelworks, with more than 18,000 employees and producing 4 million tonnes of steel annually. And Van Gelder's paper mills, with a yearly output of 100,000 tonnes of newsprint. The Coast Guard and port offices in Imauden keep a close watch on the traffic entering and leaving the North Sea Canal. Through the Imauden locks pass huge quantities of raw materials to satisfy the needs of growing industries in Holland and the other countries of Western Europe. The increase in the number and draft of ships using the North Sea Canal made it necessary to widen and deepen the harbour mouth, the dock basins and the interconnecting waterways. A gigantic project was started in 1960 with the aim of making the area accessible to ocean giants. The task of bringing Amsterdam as near to the open sea as possible commenced in 1865. It included the construction of locks. At the seaward end of the canal, breakwaters just short of a mile in length were built out to sea to provide shelter in the harbour entrance. The crane used on that project was primitive by our standards. It was a mighty struggle against the elements. At times the work of weeks was washed away in a single night. But the result was a fantastic piece of engineering which continues to draw admiration to this very day. The vessels using the canal grew in size. Moreover, the presence of wartime wrecks and a sandbank and the limitations imposed by the width and depth of the waterway itself hampered their movements. It was decided to improve the harbour entrance and to make it suitable for ocean giants of 100,000 tonnes. Soundings were taken and plans drawn up for the construction of new breakwaters and the dredging of an approach channel suitable for vessels drawing 43 feet. The echo sounding apparatus used provided the experts with valuable information concerning the profile of the sea bed. The design for the new harbour entrance resulted from extensive tests at the Netherlands Hydraulics Laboratory. These showed that part of the southern breakwater would have to be demolished, both breakwaters taken more than two miles out to sea, and the wrecks removed. 
The change in the pattern of ebb and flood tides caused the sandbank to disperse naturally. <laughs> The French dipper dredger, Carla Neg, chartered by the State Waterways Board, was used in the demolition of 275 yards of the southern breakwater. This Goliath, with its 23 cubic yard scoop, cleared 200,000 tons of concrete and stone in the space of two years. The way was now clear for the construction of the new breakwater sections. Huge willow mattresses form the base. Between them a bed of gravel is deposited and on top of that a mass of stone. Later this stone will be rearranged by cranes to form the profile of the dam. Bituminous concrete is used for the revetment and prefabricated concrete elements form the superstructure. The foot of the dam is further protected with huge pieces of stone weighing up to six tons apiece, reinforced where necessary with 17-ton concrete blocks. The weaving of willow mattresses has remained a handcraft. The bundles of willow are laid one at a time and secured with rope. There is every reason for pride on the part of the men from Verkendam in their traditional craft, one which is handed down from father to son. The foundation of the new breakwater can now be laid. Small tugs tow the mattresses and barges filled with stone to the predetermined spot in the North Sea. Decker Hyfix apparatus is used to ensure that the mattresses come to rest in exactly the right position. On arrival at the spot, the anchors are dropped. As soon as the mattress is in position, the ropes are secured. Now ballasting can begin. Stones are dumped onto the mattress in a given sequence. First in the center. The foreman shouts an order and the gang marches. Stone is pitched onto the sides of the mattress. Faster and faster becomes the tempo. Nearly 200,000 square yards of mattress were placed in position in this manner. Then came the layer of gravel, 600,000 tons of it. Coarse grade, brought by barge from the rivers Meuse, Maine and Moselle. In Imauden, the gravel was transshipped into special barges fitted with bottom doors. The 
these hopper barges became a familiar sight in the pattern of harbour traffic. Once in position above the spot shown on the Decker apparatus, the barges discharged their contents in a matter of seconds. Start. And after the gravel, stone. In all, two million tonnes of it were needed for the breakwater project. It came from quarries in Belgium. Dynamite and large drills were used to produce pieces of the required size the smallest weighing just two pounds and the largest six tons. Two thousand trains, each consisting of sixty wagons, were needed to carry the stone to I Mountain. Placed end to end, these would have stretched from Amsterdam to Lugano in Switzerland. The trains reached Imaudan by way of the Felsen Tunnel and the Steelworks sidings. To the north and south of the harbour entrance, special shunting yards and storage areas were created to deal with the incoming material. Specially reinforced lorries and loaders with giant tyres were used to load the stone into the hopper barges. Each barge held about 600 tonnes. Day in, day out, the barges moved to and from the dumping sites. Bad weather was no obstacle. Every time the bottom doors opened, the body of the dam rose by a few feet. You might be excused for thinking that the odd stone, more or less, was of no consequence. But you would be wrong. Every load was accurately charted by the engineers of the State Waterways Board. With clock-like regularity, sounding craft checked the situation underwater. The echo sounder shows clearly how the body of the dam is growing beneath the waves. Dumping continued until the upper layer of roughly positioned stone was 11 feet 6 inches below water level. Then the body was reshaped with the aid of a heavy mobile crane. The new breakwater emerged above the surface. Later, the task of reshaping and revetting the rubble dam was taken over by two self-elevating pontoons. Built by the Husto Shipbuilding Company in Schiedam, these were towed to Imauden by tugs of the Weissmuller fleet. The two pontoons, aptly named the Crane and the Spoonbill, are each equipped with a travelling crane capable of lifting 25 tonnes at a radius of 184 feet. 
After being towed into position on either side of the dam, the eight steel legs are let down and forced into the seabed, and the pontoon is jacked up to a safe height above the waves. Huge dumpers were used to load the stone into special containers which were then picked up by the crane and the contents tipped onto a predetermined spot. A plotting installation was used to ensure the accuracy of the operation. With the aid of these pontoons, about 33 yards of breakwater was completed every week. The operations carried out with these cranes also included the final shaping of the dam body. Using special grabs, stone dumped from barges was recovered and redistributed in accordance with a fixed pattern indicated with the aid of a plotting instrument. The task of revetting the dam still remains to be done. For this, a newly developed material known as bituminous concrete was used. This consists of pieces of stone weighing between two and 130 pounds, which are heated and then mixed with asphalt. Three plants built on the site turned out this material at the rate of some 500 tons an hour. The mix at a temperature of about 100 degrees centigrade was transported from the storage silos in special 20-ton dumpers. On arrival alongside the pontoon, the load was tipped into containers suspended from the cranes by means of which it was deposited exactly in the desired position. Slowly but surely, the breakwater assumed its final shape. that remained was to place the superstructure in position. The top of the dam consists of prefabricated concrete elements. The space between the elements was filled with fresh concrete.
The areas of the foot of the dam which are most vulnerable to the action of the sea were reinforced with 17-ton concrete blocks. In all, 3,500 of these were used. They were taken 26 at a time by the workboat Peter, a vessel equipped for side discharge. In the meantime, the wrecks which had obstructed shipping in the entrance to the harbour were being removed. Two dredgers and other craft were put to work. The dredgers created a huge pit into which the three large and numerous small wrecks slid until they were 66 feet below sea level, twice the depth at which they previously lay. Four and a half million cubic yards of sand were dredged in creating the pit, and more than half of this was pumped ashore to create an artificial sandy beach to the south of the southern breakwater. This model shows how the wrecks were swallowed up in their deep grave in the space of seven months during 1965. The trailing suction dredger WD Seaway was employed to widen and deepen the navigable channel. Operating day and night in all weathers, she filled her hopper in one hour. The spoil was dumped at sea. Increasing the width of the northern outer canal from 55 to 140 yards meant the disappearance of part of Fort Island. Sixteen pillboxes were demolished, adding 25,000 cubic yards of concrete to the material to be cleared. The width of the northern outer canal will eventually be increased to 220 yards. An expansion project by the blast furnaces and steelworks meant that a new dock basin had to be created for the temporary shelter of damaged vessels. The system of beacons in the harbour had to be brought into line with the new situation. The changes in the navigable channel necessitated moving one of the lighthouses 45 yards. New port lights were installed at the extremities of the breakwaters. The new harbour entrance was completed in 1967. Now ships of 100,000 tonnes and drawing 43 feet can sail in and out of Imaden, and thus Amsterdam, at any state of the tide. The North Sea Canal was widened and deepened to take the ocean giants. A number of new dikes were built. The width of the canal at the bed was increased from 55 to nearly 190 yards. In the years which this film covers, the largest ever extension and modernization of the port facilities in the North Sea Canal area were carried out simultaneously. The growth of shipping in this area led to a tremendous expansion of the harbour basins in Amsterdam, the new development being in a westerly direction. The project was completed. The official opening was performed by Her Majesty Queen Juliana of the Netherlands. Hiermee open ik de nieuwe havenmond van het Noordzeekanaal. A new safe entrance had been created at a cost of 215 million guilders. Through it will come vessels of up to 100,000 tons, bringing cargoes destined not only for Holland but for the whole European hinterland. Truly a clear way to progress.